Destination Unknown, Chapter 2, First Part The girl was sitting up in bed. She looked like a snow-capped doll. The plaster for removing radioisotopes that covered her limbs was called snow parts. Glowing faintly in the evening from the radiation it had drawn from her body, it hid the soul-chilling tragedy that had befallen her beneath the beauty of new-fallen snow. There's no immediate threat to her life. I believe you heard all about her condition from Pluto the Eighth. Dee met the physician's words with silence. The girl, Lori, was reflected in the hunter's eyes. But what deeper emotions the sight of her stirred in Dee's psyche even Dr. Sarugi couldn't tell. Or maybe it didn't stir anything at all. The physician thought that it'd be entirely appropriate for the young man. They were in one of the rooms in the hospital that stood near the center of the residential sector. Dr. Sarugi and a middle-aged nurse lived there and treated every imaginable ailment, dealing with everything from the common cold to installing cyborg parts. His skill at being able to handle such a wide range of health problems made him a qualified and accomplished circuit doctor. Could I put some questions to her in writing? Dee's query put Dr. Sergi's head at a troubled tilt. Perhaps for a short time, he said reluctantly. It's just... Dee waited for his explanation. I'd like you to refrain from asking her any questions that may likely prove shocking. We're dealing with a young lady who's been seriously wounded, both physically and psychologically. She's already well aware of what the future holds for her. How old is she? Seventeen. D nodded. The physician looked rather concerned, but he soon walked over to Lori's bedside, took the memo pad and an electromagnetic pen from beside her pillow, and jotted something down. An introduction for Dee, no doubt. Her white shoulders shook a bit. Her downturned face shifted slightly toward Dee, then stopped. Dee watched expressionlessly as her face turned down again, and her lily-white fingers took the electromagnetic pen from the physician. The pen moved with short, powerful strokes, like it was fighting something off. Tearing off the page, the physician stood up straight and handed the message to Dee. In beautiful, precise penmanship, it read, Thank you very much. Returning the sheet to the physician, Dee settled himself into the chair beside Lori's bed without saying a word. The blue eyes peeking out from under her various white wrappings suddenly opened wide. The girl turned her face away. Quickly bringing it back, she cast her gaze downward. From her reaction, she apparently recognized Dee. The physician got another pen and notepad and handed them to Dee. The hunter's hand quickly went into action. There's someone in your house, he wrote. Were there any strange occurrences there before? Laurie stared at the page he'd given her, and continued to do so for a long time. It seemed like nearly ten minutes passed before she shook her head from side to side. Once again, Dee's hand scrawled a few words. Do you know what your father's experiments involved? Again, she shook her head. D readied his pen once more. Lori shook her head. Over and over she shook it. Her shoulders began to quake, too. Bits of healing plaster fell from her like snowflakes. Dr. Sarugi held her shoulders steady. Still, 
Lori tried to go on, shaking her head. Kindly leave. Hurry. The physician said to Dee. The door swung open and the nurse rushed in. Getting to his feet, Dee asked, Where's Pluto the Eighth staying? As I recall, he's in P9 in the Special Residential District. It's right by the Law Enforcement Bureau. The physician called out, but his words merely echoed off the closed door and died away. Page break indicated by a small cross. Exiting the hospital, Dee walked down the street. Despite the sudden madness they'd witnessed in Lori, his eyes were as cold and clear as ever. Any human emotion would have seemed like a blemish when it showed in the young man's eyes. Though plenty of people were coming and going on the street, the path directly ahead of Dee was completely unobstructed. Every last person in his way stepped aside. They didn't do this out of the superstitious, ingrained distaste they had for those who dwelled outside their society, but because of the young man's good looks and the aura about him. Everyone knew. They also knew that not everyone out on the street was necessarily human. And yet, there was a hint of intoxication in the eyes of all as they gazed at Dee. His gorgeous features made them shudder with something other than fear. And not only the women, but even the men felt a sort of sexual excitement when they saw him. Most of the people wore work clothes and carried farm implements. Working the earth wasn't quite the same in a sector of a moving town, but people went about the business of living as best they could. They labored. On the far side of the park lay farms and fields, as well as a sprawling industrial sector. Dee soon found the Law Enforcement Bureau. Despite the grandiose name, it was no different from the sheriff's office you'd find in any town this size. The group of blue buildings across the street made up the special residential district. A pair of three-story buildings that looked like hotels. That was all there was to the district. As Dee came to the door, a cheerful voice shouted to him from across the street. On turning, the hunter found Pluto the Eighth trotting his way. Both his hands were covered by a variety of colors. Flowers. Hey, what are you doing, stud? The biker wore a personable smile that made his hostility back at the mayor's house seem long forgotten. Once he'd reached E, he looked all around them. They're mighty unfriendly in this town, he groused. I heard there ain't a single florist anywhere. Someone said there was a flower garden, so I went to have a look-see. They tell me out there they don't sell to outsiders. Well, that ain't so rare in itself, but I tell them, Damn it! I want to take them to a sick friend! And still they wouldn't give me the okay. He was truly indignant about this. Foam flying from his mouth, he added. Hell, I told him the flowers were for Lori. I say, she used to live here just like the rest of you, right? I don't care if her family decided to leave. It ain't like she came back here because she wanted to. She lost her mother and father and got hurt real bad herself and only came back to try and save her life. Son of a... They still told me I couldn't have them. Said that once you leave town, you're an outsider. To his snarling companion, D said softly, So... How did you get those flowers, then? Well, uh, you know. Anyway, I was pretty pissed off at the time. That's not exactly new territory for you, though. Yeah, you could say that. Pluto the Eighth confessed easily. It was frightening how quickly his mood could change. 
Oh, well, not much I can do now. Anyway, did you have business with me? I want to ask you something. Is that a fact? Well, let's not stand around here jawing. There's a bar around the corner. What do you say to having a drink while we talk? Laughing, he added, Don't think they serve human blood, though. Knowing exactly who he was saying this to, his joke might have had deadly repercussions. But Dee didn't seem to mind. He followed Pluto the Eighth. Page break indicated by a small cross. The bar was packed. Work in town must have been done in shifts. As the two of them entered, all chatter in the watering hole stopped dead. The eyes of the bartender and the men around the various tables focused on the pair. Excuse me, coming through, pardon me. Pluto the Eighth called out amiably as they slipped between the crowded tables, finally seating themselves at an empty one in the back. In a terribly gruff voice, he shouted, Hey, I'd like a bitter beer. That and a... Turning to D, he asked in a completely baffled manner, What'll you have? Nothing. Dope? You can't just walk into a bar and order nothing. You're a nuisance. Yelling. You'll have the same. To the bartender, Pluto the Eighth turned to D again. So, what's this business you have with me? I went into a certain house earlier, D said. There was someone strange inside. Wasn't you, was it? What do you mean? I don't think anyone from town would be rooting through the house at this late date. And the only ones here from somewhere else are you and me. Pluto the Eighth leaned back and laughed heartily. Those seated around them flinched and gave him unsettled looks. Hate to disappoint you, but it wasn't me. Hell, even if it was me, you think I'd just come right out and say so? Why are you here? Seems someone like you would be better off leaving town. I tend to agree with you, Pluto the Eighth conceded easily. But it ain't that simple. Why, compared to the world down there, this place is like heaven. If you got money to spend, you can buy just about anything. You can get by without messing around with any of the nobility's deadly little pals. I tell you, I plan to stick around until they toss me out of my ear. You couldn't buy flowers, Dee reminded him. Yeah, but that don't change much. But, just as his confident smile spread across his gruff face, a number of people filed in through the bar door. A gray-haired crone was at the fore, and behind her three powerful-looking men. All four were pale with anger. Dee's eyes dropped the bouquet on the table, and he said, You stole those, didn't you? Uh, no, I'm renting them, you big dope. I just didn't leave a deposit for them. The whole bar started to buzz with chatter, and a bunch of people gathered around Dee and Pluto the Eighth's table. There he is. There's the no-good flower thief, I'm sure of it. The crone shrieked. Her bony finger aimed at Pluto the Eighth's face. Now that ain't a very nice thing to say, Pluto the Eighth said, knitting his brow. I'm just borrowing these to take them to a sick friend, okay? What could make a flower happier than that? The hell you say? The crone's hairline in the corners of her eyes rose with her tone. Do you have any idea how much back-breaking toil it takes to grow a single flower in this town? Of course you don't. You're a dirty, rotten thief. He sure is. Another person surrounding the table chimed in, and thieves gotta pay a price. Let's step outside. Nothing doing. Pluto the Eighth laughed mockingly. What do you do if I don't go? Then we'll have no choice but to use force. 
and the biker's confident laughter flew in the faces of the tense men. Do you folks know who the hell I am? I'm the one and only John M. Brass, L.A. Pluto the Eighth, known far and wide across the frontier. Silence. What? You bastards never heard of me? Pluto the Eighth said with a scowl. Well, at any rate, I bet you know my friend here. The most handsome cuss on the frontier. A first-rate slayer of nobility. An apostle of the dream demons. And all the beauty of the darkness in human form, I give you the vampire Hunter D. Every face around them went pale. Even those of the men in the very back of the bar. Hell of a reputation he's got, eh? Pluto the Eighth chortled. Looking around at the men who were now still and pale as corpses, he asked, Still want us to step outside? My buddy can split a laser beam in two. For your information, this doesn't concern me at all, said D. His gaze fixed on the same spot on the table the whole time. What do you mean? Pluto the Eighth said, bugging his eyes. Oh, you're cold-blooded. Aren't we buddies? Don't listen to him, guys. Pluto the Eighth laughed. He was only joking. Go outside if you want. But leave me out of this, said the hunter. I don't believe you, Pluto the Eighth rose indignantly. Did you forget about the beer I just bought you? Sorry, sir, but that... Someone called from behind the bar. We just ran out of your beer. Damn it all, this just ain't my day. Pluto the Eighth cursed. Quit your belly aching and step outside already, said one of the men surrounding D. Stealing flowers is stealing all the same, and a thief still got to pay the price. Oh, really? And what did you have in mind? A thousand lashes with the electron whip for thirty days hard labor. Don't care much for either. Well, I'll go out with you anyway. Giving D a look that could kill, Pluto the Eighth didn't seem terribly afraid as he followed the men out. Still, it wasn't the fight headed outside that every eye in the place was following. Their eyes were riveted to the handsome young man who remained at the table. Four men escorted Pluto the Eighth outside. Two of them were in their thirties, while the other two were younger. And they must have been around twenty years old. As was normal for laborers on the frontier, the mass of their muscles was evident even through their rough apparel. Every one of them stood over six feet tall. Pluto the Eighth, on the other hand, was five foot four. And the bike was just as big through the chest and shoulders, but... In a bare knuckle brawl, he'd be at an overwhelming disadvantage. Snapping his fingers, Pluto the Eighth asked, Okay, who wants to be first? Don't go looking to get yourself hurt any worse than need be, said the man who seemed to be their leader. Just come along quietly to the Law Enforcement Bureau and take your pick of the two punishments, and then this'll all be over. Pluto the Eighth chuckled. Not a chance. His face brimmed with self-confidence. Beneath the beard that hid his mouth, his deep red tongue was licking his lips. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's assholes who get all tough when the numbers are on their side. See, I'm more of a loner, so don't just stand there acting scary. Hurry up and come get a piece of me. Even before he had time to realize the last bit had been a challenge, the young man on the left took a swing at Pluto the Eighth. He didn't say a word, and didn't even exhale. He must have been a first-rate brawler. Just as the two figures were about to make contact, Pluto the Eighth backed away without moving a muscle. Still swinging his right hand down as hard as he could, 
The young man had no time to compensate and hit the ground shoulder first. What the hell happened? The perfect timing of the biker's defense against the attack almost made it look like the two of them were in collusion. Okay, next! said the broadly smirking Pluto the Eighth. He didn't look the least bit perturbed. In fact, he seemed to be enjoying the brawl. Whatever weird trick he had up his sleeve, it made Dr. Surugi's martial arts seem in commonplace by comparison. The remaining trio of opponents were united by disquiet. What's the problem? I'll take the three of you at once. Look! Both hands hanging down by his side so he was left wide open, Pluto the Eighth lifted his chin to them as if begging them to punch it. Howling curses, the two men in their thirties rushed him, one from the front, the other from behind. Trusting the abdominal muscles they'd hardened with a deep breath to protect them from any odd attack by Pluto the Eighth. The men had their arms spread wide to smash the little guy like a bug. It was a plan of attack that made it plain, and they had little regard for someone of his small stature. In a moment it became clear that was a mistake. As the two men came together to crush him, there was no trace of Pluto the Eighth there. And the instant his form came back to Earth some ten feet away, his massive assailants fell face first with a force that shook the ground. What the diminutive man had accomplished in this battle, in the chill sunlight, was nothing short of miraculous. Nimbly, Pluto the Eighth turned around. The face of the one young adversary who remained was right before him. And it was more bloodless now than when he'd heard Dee's name mentioned before. You coming to get me? How about it, Sonny? The only reply the young man had for that affable query was a dash in the opposite direction. Watching the young tough run away without so much as a glance behind him, Pluto the Eighth's gaze was unexpectedly warm. And then his eyes shifted to the entrance to the bar. What do you think of that? Am I faster than that sword of yours? His tone was so steeped in self-confidence it made the sunlight pale by comparison. But Dee's only reply was a dark silence. Well then, I'm off to see a certain little lady next. You coming with me? Giving no answer... D turned away. Buddy! I don't care how damn good looking you are! You gotta get a bit more sociable! I tell ya, women these days are interested in what's inside a man. Cackling in a way that made it clear he was pleased with himself. Even Pluto the Eighth couldn't be sure if his words had reached the black clad figure, whose back was now dwindling in the distance. First part, end.